A number of people warned me against writing a book about boys and men because it's such a fraught subject, particularly in politics right now, and because so many people were afraid that merely drawing attention to the problems of boys and men was implying somehow less effort being paid to girls and women, that it's framed as a zero sum, and it's sort of a whose side are you on? You know, the, uh, this point is so interesting to me uh, and sad um, that, you know, I went to a uh, I went to a military boarding school growing up, and we had this um, saying that we had to learn, uh, Culver Culver Military Academy, and, and we were taught the hope to win, the zeal to dare, contempt for what is base and mean, pride and achievement that is fair, and high regard for what is clean, the courage, the strength that is in brotherhood, the courage to claim proclaim success, the will to strive for what is good. And first and always, manliness. And that felt so good to nail that, number one, and also embrace that And as a young man um, when I was 17, 18. And now, um, <laughs> the, the few times I bring it up, you know, um, or when I tell somebody about it, it almost sounds like toxic masculinity. Um, the fact that I had to learn that, memorize it, and be able to recite it uh, on cue, and the fact that I'm proud about it. Um, I'm uncomfortable bringing that up in conversation. Um, and it's because I feel like there's this, there's this trend right now that, and I, and this is the reason I wanted to bring it up on, um, on monk mode, you know, because I think wellness, a big part of wellness is being comfortable in your own skin, feeling like you're valued, valued, feeling like you have a place in society and in your community. And I feel like men more and more are being made to feel like they don't have a place. They're not valued. Like there's something wrong with them. They are the problem, especially if they happen to be masculine and champion mask, true masculine qualities, not it's, you know, the, the qualities that insecure men have. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's this attitude now that champion, champion, championing, um, being a champion of masculine qualities, um, that, that there's something wrong with that. And somehow if you're champ, being a champion of masculine masculine qualities, that you're against women or that you're against femininity um, or something like that, or, or, or that you're against men who don't ex exemplify masculine qualities. There's nothing, it's none of my business, but I think it's important that there are masculine men because when it's time to stand up for somebody or someone needs to be stood up for, whether it's in an office or something more physical and dangerous, you want a masculine man to do it. Um, and especially if <laughs> you need to stand up to another masculine man, not a masculine man, but an insecure man who's an a-hole, you need to stand up to someone who's a bad man. You need a masculine man to do that. And um, it scares me that masculinity is being vilified and also being put in this light that, that makes it perceived to be, you know, some an idea that's somehow against women or bad for women or something like that. Um, and I also believe that men and women can have different levels of both masculine and feminine energy. I think some of the most masculine men in the world have a healthy amount of feminine energy. I think some of the most feminine women in the world have a healthy amount of masculine energy. And some are, you know, six more masculine than others. And there's nothing wrong with that and so on and so forth. But I think when it comes down to it, and somebody wants someone to stand up for them or protect them or defend them um, or be kind or empathetic in a situation um, where someone's exposed or being uh, vulnerable, you want somebody with masculinity and there's nothing wrong with that. True masculinity, not insecure men, <laughs> male behavior. Question, and you have to be on one side or the other rather than just being on the side of human flourishing. One of the real challenges here is that if there are men missing from certain crucial areas of our society and our economy, that makes it harder for other men and boys to flourish in those areas. We have an education system that has a dearth of male teachers. We have a labor market where the jobs that are growing fastest are ones where we have the fewest men. And in families, there's the growth in what you might call the dad deficit or fatherlessness. As men are struggling in each of those areas, what you'll see is it'll be hard. He talked about the the, the dad deficit, the, the father de deficit. And another thing that scares me about the future is that, you know, when you look back, uh, and obviously I'm only 40, I wasn't alive in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but I remember a world where I remember most of my friends had a father in their life. And, you know, by the early to mid 90s, it wasn't the, the case. And 
I sit and ask myself if this overwhelming attitude right now that masculinity is bad and men are bad. Um, I'm general making a generalization, but you, you know what I mean? Why were, why all of a sudden when there were less men in the household, more single mothers, um, did we end up with these young men and grown men that are honestly insecure monsters, um, who commit crimes, um, if you, if you, you know, if you look at it statistically, the vast majority of like men who are getting in trouble or incarcerated, most of them didn't have fathers, but they had mothers <laughs> They had mothers, and they were raised often by single mothers. I was raised a lot of my life by a single mother and, um, and the mothers did the best job they could, but a woman can't prepare a man for what it, a manhood, a, a boy for manhood. She can't do that. What she can do is provide the important ingredient element of being a man which is respecting women knowing how to talk to them uh defend them stand up for them but also being okay with women talking to you a certain way and take and and, and taking direction from a woman and being uh respecting a woman that's my mom i respect her i listen to her um i i try to emulate her in certain situations that's an important part of being a man but to be a complete man you need the influence of another man I think that's super important. And um, I also think to be a complete woman, you need the influence of a father or some fatherly figure or someone in your life that you can develop a positive relationship with them, a positive, obviously, influence. Um, and so I think it can be just I think it can be just as the dangerous to the development of a person, regardless of gender, to not have a man in the household, a masculine masculine man in, in their lives. Um, but just getting back to the, the, the point, less men in the household, more single family homes, more men in prison, more dangerous men that people are afraid of. When I say dangerous, I mean actual toxic men, <laughs> insecure men committing crimes, beating women, being hard on them. And I think it, they need to see other men who are masculine, who do masculine things, respecting women, defending the weak um, that can't defend themselves. Um, they need to see a masculine man look at their wife and say, you know what? You're right. And I'm sorry. Um, and do that with their mother, their wife, their daughter, their friend who happens to be a woman. They need to see another masculine man do that in order for them to be ushered into manhood in a way that's not destructive. Um, and, and is what I call masculine. And I think masculine is one of the most positive things. That, that a man can be. Their footsteps. It's harder for boys to flourish if their fathers aren't engaged. It's harder for men to enter occupations where there aren't men. It's harder for boys to do well at school where there are no male teachers to be seen. And so there's a very real danger that unless we act quite soon, that we will set in train. Something of a vicious cycle. And what he's saying, which is inter interesting, if we're not having more men in the classroom, in the household, Hope you know. Hopefully, we don't lose them on the sports field and so on and so forth. It's harder for young men to develop in a healthy way, and he says that we're in we're we're in for a very troubled society if we don't get ahead of this. I think it's too late. By the way, I think we're there. Um, I think the men that are going to be twenty eight in six years, I don't think we can change them. It's too late. Their formative years have passed. Um, they've been a, allowed to get away with um, the things that are toxic. For, for, you know, their, their teens. And um, I don't think they're going to change. I think it's too late. And I think we need to do, number one, two things. Number one, we need to get ahead of focus, focusing on what can we do to make sure there are masculine men for youngsters that can be molded still to look up to. Not the, um, what's the guy, Andrew Tate. Not the Andrew Tates of the world. He's funny. He, he makes, you know, 20% of what he says are good points. 80% of them are horrible and not true um, and sad and young men sh shouldn't be listening to them. But I think if there's not a stronger voice talking to the young men who are 9, 10, 12 years old, et cetera, where the problem is going to be way worse. But we already have a problem. Um, I think there also needs to be a voice for the people who are and they're going to be who are 19 or 20 and going to be 28 in so many years and be the people working at companies, uh, be the people that are, are trying to get into politics. Like it's these people that are going to be in those positions that we're really nervous about. Now, some of them will have tragedies. 
um, have great failures where their attitude and their 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 habits have gotten them in trouble because they aren't truly masculine. They need something to refer to. Um, you know, and I think there's a small, there's a minority of those men who will change over time um, once they make mistakes or, you know, lose a, the woman of their dreams or lose a best friend for being an idiot. Um, but I think the vast majority of the men that are 19 or 20 are about to be a problem for everybody. So anyway, just my opinion. I'm Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And my latest book is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why That Matters, and What to Do About It. The overall picture is that on almost every measure, at almost every age, and in almost every advanced economy in the world, the girls are leaving the boys way behind, and the women leaving the men. What nobody ex and it's interesting. I think it's important to say that the girls are getting ahead of the men. Um, and all the businesses that I've owned, um, the women have always been the leaders because honestly, they're smarter. They tend to do a better job. Um, they're more punctual, um, and they're just you know they just they just do a better job. They're efficient and so on and so forth. I mean, I don't know that it's always been that way. And I, I'm saying that not to as a dig on men in general. I'm saying that as a dig on the, the, the crop of men that are out in the workforce right now, um, I just don't feel like they've been developed um, properly. And, and also, I will say also, in addition to that, I'm so happy also that women are thriving um, because I do think there are so many areas where they're better suited to, um, to lead um, more than men. Um, and for instance, uh, finance, women who are in finance, from what I've been told or some of the statistics I've looked at um, are, are more statistics driven, risk averse, are better at managing money, whether it be funds, um, private equity, leading private equity firms or whatever. I've been told that um, uh, I think men, I think women are better at a lot of things that typically are dominated, dominated by when what men. Um, and it's important that we see more women in leadership positions. Right. But I do think there's a deficit of men in the workforce, um, and it's because they're just not prepared. Um, and when I say the workforce, all the new jobs that are coming about. What nobody expected was that girls and women wouldn't just catch up to boys and men in education, but would blow right past them and keep going. Everyone was very focused, quite rightly, on getting to gender equality, getting to gender parity. It's not that long ago where there was a huge gender gap the other way and there was huge focus correctly in the 70s and 80s to really promote women and girls in education. But the line just kept going and nobody predicted that. Nobody was saying, what if gender inequality re-emerges in just as big a way as now, in some cases bigger, but the other way around. And to some extent, everyone's still trying to get their head around this new world where, at least in education, when you talk about gender inequality, you're pretty much always talking about the ways in which girls and women are ahead of boys and men. And that's happened in a very, very short period of human history. So if you look at the US, for example, in the average school district in the US, girls are almost a grade level ahead of boys in English and have caught up in math. If we look at those with the highest GPA scores, the top 10%, two thirds of those are girls. If we look at those at the bottom, two thirds of those are boys. When it comes to going to college, there's a 10 percentage gap in college enrollment, a similar size gap in completing college, conditional on enrolling. And the result of those trends is that the gender gap in getting a college degree is now wider than it was in 1972, but the other way around. Also an important point. I think this is so great because I think when we talk about championing, which I, that word I can't say today, masculinity, once again, people tend to take it as a dig uh, or like we're against women um, or men should be strong. I don't know how people take it the wrong way. Um, and um, I think for me, at least in that same conversation, it's important to acknowledge that. And I truly believe this. I have a daughter. I don't have a son. Women are better at men at a number of things. There, there are a lot of things that are important to how society functions that women are just naturally better suited to do. And I think some of the statistics statistics that he's referencing 
are not just a reflection of poor rearing and, and development of young men. I think it's partly due to that. But I think it's also <laughs> a reflection of women finally getting the respect and opportunities they deserve and us seeing how much better they are at certain things than men. And I think that's important to acknowledge. There are some things that men are better to, suited to do than women. And it's not the things that Andrew Tate talks about typically. So I'm not going there, but there, women are better suited to do certain things. Men are better suited to do certain things. It's just a fact of life. People with certain types of personalities are better suited to do certain types of jobs. And if you refer to, if you believe in the, uh, or subscribe to the Myers-Briggs um, take uh, on the on personalities, it's statistically proven that certain personalities are better suited to do certain things. Um, and I think it's okay to say that certain genders are better, naturally, statistically going to be better at certain things. And I think it's a great, um, these statistics are great to show that um, women really do uh, outshine men. Um, he's talking about academics, but there's so many other are areas where women are better. So in 1972, when Title IX was passed to promote more gender equality in education, there was a 13 percentage point gap in favor of men getting college degrees. Now there's a 15 percentage point gap in favor of women getting college degrees. So the gender inequality we see in college today is wider than it was 50 years ago. It's just the other way around. There's quite a fierce debate about the differences between male and female brains. And in adulthood, I think there's not much evidence that the brains are that different in ways that we should worry about or that are particularly consequential. But where there's no real debate is in the timing of brain development. It is quite clear that girls' brains develop more quickly than boys' brains do, and that the biggest difference seems to occur in adolescence. So what happens is in adolescence, we develop what neuroscientists call the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex of our brain is sometimes known as the CEO of the brain. It's the bit of your brain that says you should do your chemistry homework rather than going out to party. It's the bit of your brain that says it is worth maintaining a high GPA because it will help you get to college, which might help you in the future. And that bit of the brain develops considerably earlier in girls than in boys, between one and two years earlier, partly because girls go... So this is interesting, and I think it once again proves uh, my point in a certain way. I think you would, it's based on what he's saying, it's easy. You, you could extrapolate um, or deduce that at the age of 23, a male, I'm sorry, a female, a woman, has been, has had the brain of an adult longer than a man has, 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 has been in tune with her executive functioning longer than a man has at the same age. It's a fact, and it's okay to say because that. Because girls go into puberty a bit earlier than boys, and that seems to trigger some of this development. What that means is that if you have an education system that rewards the ability to turn in homework, stay on task, worry about your GPA, prepare for college and so on, then just structurally, that's going to put an advantage the group whose brains have developed earlier in those particular areas. And that turns out on average to be girls. I think it's a great irony of women's progress that by taking the brakes off women's educational opportunities and aspirations, we've revealed the fact that the education system is slightly structured against boys and men because of these differences in the timing of brain development. But it took... What I don't agree with uh, that he just said um, is that the system is structured against men. Um, definitely, I don't think it's on purpose. Maybe today it is, but... Uh, historically, I just, I don't know. I just don't believe that. That's my opinion. And, um, but I think it could be structured in a way without people knowing it could be structured in a way that, um, that women thrive in better than men. And we didn't learn that until we took the brakes off the development of women and made sure that the opportunities were equal and, the, and that the respect was equal. I think you could also argue that there tend to be more, uh, female or women teachers than men that might affect the curriculum, the fact that it was designed by women and so on and so forth. The fact that women who are performing better than men at in school, oftentimes, well, the teacher's a woman as well. I think um, you learn better and you absorb better sometimes, but I, I don't know the statistics, but I would assume that you might absorb better and be engaged better with someone who looks like you, talks like you, feels like you, et cetera. Um, so there may be something there, but long story short, I just, 
I don't believe the system is designed against women. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't believe the system is designed against men. I just think it's landed in a place where men do not thrive as much as women do in the system. And, and it probably needs to be fixed. I think the same argument can be made for, you know, the people that believe that um, uh, systemic racism is, is a thing. And I think that the system is designed to hurt black people, so to speak, or hurt Mexican people or, or women or so on and so forth. Um, I do think there's a lot of laws that need to be changed and policies. And I do think there's a lot of hearts and minds work. But I think to, in this day and age, I'm not talking about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, but I think in 2024, I think it's more like what, what he's saying. It's more a system that is is tuned, has been tuned because of you know laws on top of laws on top of laws without every, it, people really considering the long-term effects and how they interplay with each other. Policies on top of policies, customs on top of customs on top of customs. I think the system has been tuned in a way that may not be conducive to the to the um, to the progress of a certain gender or a certain race or something. It may not be conducive to the progress of that certain person versus another person or another race or another gender. That just might be a fact of life, right? That may be the. But I don't think we can say that today. It's it's been done on purpose, right? And that. Somebody sat back and 10 men and got in a room and said, let's design a racist system. I don't think that's happening in 2024. I do think people are making decisions based on private interests, who, who their funders are. <laughs> they just want to get elected, et cetera. And they come up with these dumb laws and dumb policies that hurt people. Um, and collectively, with this dumb policy, this dumb policy over here, this policy that doesn't make sense. And it was done just because somebody was on the take combined aligned i think it not just can hurt minorities or or a pre, uh, underrepresented um people or or, or can just hurt certain races or women i think it can hurt every, some of these policies can hurt everybody um but i think too often people say oh the system is racist the system is racist no i think the system is flawed there's nothing wrong with saying it's flawed but i think saying something's inherently racist or that there is an intention behind a system to hurt or hold back a certain people, I think we have to be really careful and understand that human nature is human nature. Most systems are not perfect because humans aren't perfect. And maybe just somebody made a mistake or maybe times have changed or maybe we didn't know that this system was designed in a way that was going to benefit women more than men until we gave women the equal opportunity to participate in it. And now we've learned. So I disagree with his words. I think his point is valid. If you if you strip away the words and just look at the point he's trying to make, um, the the idea, but I think the words he chose, um, I, I just don't think they're accurate. Took the the women's movement to show that, because the natural advantages of women in education were impossible to see when women's aspirations were being capped by a sexist society. Now that those caps have been largely removed, we can see that it's boys and men who are at a disadvantage in the education system. At the risk of sounding boring, let's collect the data first, so we know what we're dealing with here. I do think that we should be strongly encouraging boys to start school a year later than girls. I think that should become the default in many school districts because of the developmental gap that there is between boys and girls. Because boys' brains mature more slowly, then them starting school a year later would mean that they were developmentally closer to being peers with the girls in the classroom. We need a lot more male teachers. It's striking that the teaching profession has become steadily more female over time. Only 24% of K-12 teachers now are male. That's down from 33% in the 80s. And fewer men are applying to teacher training year on year. And so we've seen this steady shift towards a close to an all-female environment. That has all kinds of consequences for the ethos of the school, for the way we deal with different kinds of behavior among boys and girls, for example. And so we need a very serious... And by the way, I think one of the reasons, I don't know, but... I would venture to, to say or guess that one of the reasons that there's less men in the classroom is because masculinity is not being championed um, or supported or embraced. And to me, if men are in an, in an environment where they don't feel valued or embraced, et cetera, um, they're not going to want to be there. 
so could be wrong, but that's just how I feel. Be serious and intentional effort to get more men into teaching. The third thing I would do in this world where I have significant power to dictate policies would be significantly more investment in vocational education and training. That is a could not agree more. Trades, plumbing, uh, being able to do electric work, uh, being an electrician, etc. Um, these are some of the best jobs, especially if you don't want to go to college or you're fresh out of college, um, as opposed to going and spending eighty thousand dollars on school, going into debt, spending four years not developing what could be your lifelong profession. You could actually be making. $50,000 a year at the age of 19, $75,000 a year at the age of 21, $150,000 a year by the time you're 25 or more, $250,000 a year and owning your own business and you're in your mid thirties, retiring in your mid forties with no debt. How about that? It's an area where we do seem to see better results for boys and men on average, and one that's woefully underinvested in in the US. The US has really bet most of its dollars on a very academic, a very narrow route towards success and less emphasis on vocational training. And you know what I think is what would be beautiful if college was like this is, um, and why can't college be this way? 50% vocational training. So you leave college with some hard skills <laughs> and also the ability to like maintain your own household and not go into debt trying to fix things. Um, and then another 50% based on Fine, the fine arts or uh, liberal arts or history or wh whatever it is, but things other than vocational skills or business or accounting or something, but like true vo vocational skills, like that's what this world, is, that's what this country's built on. And honestly, there's not enough people to, to man all the jobs that are available right now, for instance, in the plumbing space. Um, and it's sad. It's sad that the people aren't willing to do those jobs. The jobs are not that bad. And to be honest, once you see the money it can provide you, the simplicity that you can go home and turn off your phone and be with your family and afford to do that at an early age. Um, these are better jobs than like <laughs> being an accountant for, for a lot of people because your parents told you that was a good job or having to being forced to be a doctor and work, you know, three, four nights with no sleep um, with your pay for doctors typically, you know, generally they're steadily, the pay is steadily going down. Um, not having a relationship with your kids or your spouse because you wanted to tell everybody you're a doctor and you could have been saying, making the same money as a plumber by the time you're 38. I think I'm not saying that you should be a plumber, not a doctor. You should do what you're passionate about. Um, but I think looking at things like plumbing um, with disdain, and that's what you do if you don't have a college degree um, or if you're not sophisticated to go into an, an immense amount of debt with no real plan to pay for it when you come out of college because no one's hiring people based on college degrees anymore. Um, I just think it's, 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 a, it's sad. And that has actually put boys and men at a disadvantage. So apprenticeships, technical high schools are actually a really good way to help more boys and men. It's not just a way to help, a good way to help boys and men. It's a good way to help the economy because and, and a lot of people forget this piece but because so many people are not qualified people say Americans don't want to do the jobs and that may be true but there's a lot of Americans young men especially and also women who could be qualified for these jobs um, but didn't know about vocational school didn't know about the money they can make etc and weren't taught this at an early age at 12 um, no one was sensationalizing trade trade jobs and there's so many trade opportunities that are financed by the government um, and so on and so forth that there's not enough Americans to fill these jobs. They're just not qualified. Welding, et cetera. And immigration is necessary <laughs> to, to fill these jobs. And everybody's, a, you know, a lot of people are upset about immigration. I'm also upset about it because I don't believe in illegal immigration. Um, but I do think it's important to have people from other countries come in and do these jobs if Americans are not qualified to do them because the, the show must go on. My preference would be Americans are qualified to take these jobs and they're excited about these jobs and they can write back home and say, hey, I just became a master plumber or a master welder and I'm so proud and I sent my mom 200 bucks um, and they should be proud to talk about that when they go visit their friends and one of them went to Harvard and one of them went to Yale and one of them says, I'm a plumber. He should be proud of that. That's something that we can fix culturally. And if we don't, 
we're going to continue to have to rely on people from other countries to fill these jobs. Not a horrible thing, and I'm not, I love it. My mom's an immigrant, but I also think it's important to shore up America and keeping our men especially busy and active and, um, and feeling a sense of accomplishment for their work and feeling like they have agency because they can move the needle forward for them and their families by doing things that don't require going into $100,000 of debt. I think without that, America is in trouble. I think one of the challenges with, with this debate is that if you're talking to women and men who are, say, at the top of the economic ladder, four-year college degrees, decent incomes, they look around and they don't see some of these issues. But that's not the same for working class men. That's not the same for men lower down the economic ladder. So there's a danger that we're so busy, to borrow Sheryl Sandberg's phrase, so busy leaning in that we don't look down. The reality for men further down the ladder is very different. The economic trends for men have turned downwards along four dimensions. One is wages. Most men today earn less than most men did in 1979. Most men today earn less than most men did in 1979. Think about that for a second. And if you're a man, you know how debilitating that can be. Not being able to earn for yourself and your family um, can, can, can be emotionally debilitating. In employment, with a drop in labor force participation of eight percentage points, which means nine million men now of prime age are not working. We've seen a drop in occupational stature. And so there are now more men working in employment areas which are seen as lower status than they were in the past. And we've also seen a drop in the acquisition of skills, the kinds of skills and education that boys and men need. If boys don't get educated and men don't get skilled, they will struggle in the labor market. And across all of those domains, we've seen a downwards turn for men in the last four or five decades. And so the way in which social class divides have opened up, economic inequality has widened, is really important to understand in the context of gender inequality. If we only focus on gender gaps, then we miss the fact that both men and women at the top have done increasingly well, but that's much less true of everybody else, and especially it's less true of those from lower income backgrounds, working class boys and men, and black boys and men. You see many of those trends are amplified, and so those boys and men are really at the sharpest end of many of the social and economic changes. On the one hand, we have a- <laughs> I'm gonna play that again real quick. I firmly disagree with his words again, but the point was extremely valid. And I think it's important to be able to, to separate the words that someone used. Sometimes they mean those words, but also be able to look behind the words and say, do I know what he really meant or she really meant? I can do that. And also I can separate what someone said and felt at the moment from how I feel about them as a person. I think that's important. Having said that, um, he said, listen to this. Then we miss the fact that both men and women at the top have done increasingly well. Valid point. But that's much less true of everybody else. And it's so he said men and women who are at the top are doing increasingly well, which is great. So we don't see any problem there. And he's saying, but people everywhere else, which he means middle class, lower middle class, and people who are poor, that's really what he's saying, um, are not experiencing the same outcomes um, in, in their day-to-day -day life. And it's becoming a problem because that's the majority of America. The, the other 90, 95% of the, the, the nation um, or the non one to five percenters. Right. Um, and he then goes to qual give more detail on what he means by that. And listen, what, listen to what he says. And especially it's less true of those from lower income backgrounds, less true of those from lower income backgrounds, income backgrounds, working class boys, working class boys and men, boys and men and black boys and men and black boys and men. Um, so what I don't understand about that is what about the black boys and men that are college that are professors and have been for well over 100 years that are billionaires, <laughs> millionaires, millionaires, hundred thousandaires. Um, there's plenty of them and always have been. In fact, there's been there's a lot of what we call black people. I hate using, you know, terms that you know, that that draw a line on race, but you know, just to communicate, we will. Um, there are a lot of black people who in this nation that number one were, have been rich for the past hundred years. 
and their families have been rich and they've owned land and so on and so forth. So when he says black boys and men, to me, maybe I'm being sensitive, but I don't think I am. It sounds like he's looping all black boys and men into one category and saying that they're having a hard time versus just letting it be being focused on the words he used to describe America and Americans. Let's hear it one more time. Income backgrounds, working class boys. Lower income, people who come from lower income backgrounds. That includes people of all races. Working class boys and men. That includes people of all races. Why does he then have to say black boys and men? <laughs> like they're not included in what he just said. Um, and which I assume he's saying, I don't know, but you get the point. I'm going to move on. Class boys and men and black boys and men. You see men. That doesn't make him a racist. I think that just makes him a person that is not choosing the right words. He's trying to say something meaningful and he, he has a good point here. Um, and he's saying black boys and men from lower socio with a lower socioeconomic status. Um, and he's right about that. He's just poor choice of words. Many of those trends are amplified. And so those boys and men are really at the sharpest end of many of the social and economic changes. On the one hand, we have a huge and successful and laudable effort to get more women into STEM jobs. So science, technology, engineering, and math. On the other side, that's a good thing. We have what I call heel jobs. So that's health, education, administration, and literacy. Almost, if you like, the opposite side of the coin to STEM jobs. And that's where a lot of the jobs are coming from. Health and education alone are huge and growing sectors in the US. And so by my estimates, for every one job we're going to create in STEM between now and 2030, we're going to create three in heel jobs. But those jobs are at least as gender segregated as STEM jobs, but in the other direction. And unlike STEM, becoming more so over time. So if you look at the heel sector, only 24% of the workers in those sectors are male. And that number is falling. And in particular sectors, I think there's a fallacy here. He said in the heel sector, the, there's a percentage of men, 24%, and it's going down. And it is going down, and that is not a great thing. And I think men should be more represented there and continue to maintain whatever is the healthy uh, percentage. But I also think, aside from what the point he's making, I think there's something to be said for there are some jobs that masculine men don't want to do. I think it's important to um, acknowledge that it's... This, this idea of having equity across all um, sectors, I'll just say sectors, whether it's finance or, um, or certain, I think this idea, I will say that I think this idea of having um, what some people refer to equity across specific sectors, there should be, if there's, if 50% of the population are men, I don't know what the figure is, then, then they should be 50% of people in heel jobs should be men or so on and so forth. I don't believe in that because maybe 50% of men don't want that job. They don't want to do the job and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, I'll get off my high horse, but I think there's a fallacy here. I'll get off my soapbox. I mean, I think there's a fallacy here that, um, that, that, uh, he just demonstrated, but let's see, let's see what he says. We're seeing a really precipitous drop in the number of men. We have a drop in the number of male teachers. We have a very sharp drop in the number of male psychologists. That's dropped from 39%. And also doesn't account for, and hopefully hopefully he'll bring this up, but I think one of the big drops in male teachers, like I said, is because it's an environment that is not comfortable for masculine men. But also, like, are there more men in other sectors? Um, where are those men going? Some of them are just staying home and not working. Totally understand that, and that's what I'm afraid of, and that's one of the big problems. But maybe they're going out and doing other jobs. So I think he should talk about those statistics too um, so that we can have a balanced um, uh, evaluation. Number of men, we have a drop in the number of male teachers. We have a very sharp drop in the number of male psychologists. That's dropped from 39% male to 29% male in the last decade alone. And among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are male. So I'd also like to understand with these statistics, um, are we, um, I guess not adjusting, but just acknowledging that there's just more women in the workplace now. Um, I would assume they are, especially in um, jobs that require a college degree, an advanced college degree, um, jobs that maybe opportunities um, that, that didn't provide a lot of opportunities for women or equal pay. There's more women now represented in the workplace because it's more of an even playing field than it used to be. Um, so, of course, those percentages are going to go down, I would assume. And I'm not a 
mathematician, but I don't know, I'll consider that. We roll that forward and we're going to see psychology becoming essentially almost an all-female profession. So these jobs, which are both crucial, I think, for society and where it'd be very useful to have more diversity, are actually becoming more gender segregated. And so we have absolutely no effort to get more men into heel jobs, which is where I think the future lies and where we should be helping men to move. One of the problems that we face is what I call in the book a dad deficit. And that can be seen in various different ways. So one in four fathers don't live with their children. If parents split up, they're much more likely to lose contact with their fathers and with their mothers. And so one in three children, if their parents split up, don't see their father at all after a few years post the separation. So this fatherlessness is something that's very, very specific. And you said one in three children don't see their father at all after three years of separation. That's a problem. That's sad. Fatherlessness is something that's very, very specific. And when four in 10 children are born outside marriage, and most children to less educated parents are born outside marriage, then we have to reinvent what it means to be a father. Because right now, men are still being held to an old standard of what it meant to be a successful father in a world where that is neither possible for many of them or even desirable. Because what we've seen is as women have grown in economic power and economic independence, then of course they're going to choose to be with a man rather than being forced to as in the old days. This is probably the greatest liberation in human history, honestly, that women can now choose whether to be with a man or not. More than two out of five households in the US now, a woman is the main breadwinner. 40% of American women earn more than the average man. These are huge economic changes and all for the good. But it- Shout out to women, that's, that's incredible. But it does pose some really sharp questions about what fathers are for. And until we escape the obsolete model of the breadwinner father, then we- and This is, this goes back to my point of like, men need to feel that they have a purpose that they're valued, that they have a place. Women need to feel that too. Everybody needs to feel that. But let's just talk about men right now. Just what we're talking about. They need to feel that. And when they don't feel that, I think we all suffer from the problems that it creates. Then we will continue to see more and more men being left out of family life. And the kicker is that boys in families that don't have a father presence suffer much more than girls. This is an important point, and I'm not sure where he's going with this, but men who don't have purpose, don't have a sense of accomplishment, don't feel like they're um, bringing anything to the table, right? The problem with that is they're probably going to spiral emotionally. They're still going to be aggressive. They're still going to have a certain type of energy. They're still going to have qualities that come along with being a male, but they're not going to exude them. They're not going to express them in a way that I feel is masculine. They're going to express them in a way that's insecure um, and, and honestly disruptive to the rest of society. Um, they're not going to be good role models to the young men if they have a young man in their life and they're not divorced and they haven't lost that relationship or destroyed that relationship. And then once again, these are who the young men are looking up to, these men that don't there's a lot of young men, I'll say, that are looking up to men that they're looking up to whatever man they have in their, their they see in their day to day lives or hopefully have in their lives. But these can be men that don't have purpose, are acting honestly in in every aspect of their life. They're acting with insecurity. And who do you think these young men are going to emulate? The men that they see in their neighborhood, in their in their environment, in their community. So a big problem here. Um, and it becomes once again, it becomes the women's problem, the women who they come in contact with maybe at uh, a job where they don't make enough money, the women that they come in contact with, they're, they're going to act, act with those women in a way that's insecure. They find themselves in a relationship and they're not the breadwinner <laughs> or, or bringing anything of value to the table because it's okay not to be the breadwinner. They're going to act in a way that typically is insecure. It takes a lot of confidence to uh, live in a household where the woman makes more money than you because of the world we've lived in for the past few years. You need to be a real confident, secure, well-adjusted man to deal with that. And if you don't feel purpose, if you don't feel like you belong in society, but you happen to be in a relationship with a woman that's doing better than you, a lot of men, not saying myself, but a lot of men would not handle that really well.
And I hope young boys are not seeing that, but they are. And so then what happens is that male disadvantage can become intergenerational because if the fathers are struggling and therefore not really involved in their kids' lives, then the boys are the ones who suffer most, who will then go on to struggle themselves in education and the labor market. Amen to that. So I think, imagine, and I think this is super important, imagine there's a household, the, the male has maybe lost his job or uh, didn't get the right type of education or vocational training to make sure that he can consistently provide for his family. And he ends up losing his job, is unemployed, collect, collecting his check. Um, with, like I said, nothing wrong with that. And his wife continues to be the breadwinner. He's now acting insecure, maybe drinking, doing things that because he's not busy. And he's young, the young man, if, if, if he's struggling, the young man who's looking up to him most likely is going to be struggling because he's emulating that. But number two, he doesn't have a real man in his life to focus on develop, developing him and teaching him how to be a man. But imagine this, this whole situation gets turned around. His wife is a high-powered executive at Facebook, maybe, or one of these big companies or any large tech or company in general, has a great job, is a breadwinner, is setting the family up for financial success, is going to pay for the child's college and every, their children's college and everything. Let's imagine that. But then the man goes out and says, you know what, I'm going to go learn to trade. And his, his son is, let's say, 11. And he goes out and learns to trade and becomes a master welder um, or becomes a plumber, um, becomes an electrician, um, gets into the energy sector maybe and learn, learns a trade that's valued there, um, so on and so forth. Maybe it takes him two or three years. He gets that trade. His son watches him fail in life, go into maybe a, a micro depression or whatever, pick up that trade and then learn the trade. And watch him do that while his wife is while the wife is supporting everybody. It's an important lesson. Then comes out of that education process or rearing process, starts making money. And over the course of five to seven years, he looks up. And by the time that boy is getting ready for college or graduating from high school, his 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 father now is someone who's earning seventy five thousand dollars a year, hundred thousand dollars a year. The point is, he's bringing an income to the household. Um so now, and he's watched how his dad's confidence is increased. Um, and the whole, the, the whole time the father's doing this, who is he coming home and talking to about what he just learned? His family, but hopefully, hopefully this young man, he's maybe teaching his young man the trade, you know, in, in, in the garage on the weekends, um, in, in the, in the yard, in the backyard, he's teaching him a trade and also teaching him the value of a trade and also showing him before he makes it to college that, wow, I can make $150,000 a year being a plumber, or being an electrician or more, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and maybe now this man, number one, has a healthy father <laughs> father in his life that he's hopefully emulating and learning from, a father who's also supporting him. And now he can look, at, look back and say, I have a mother who is Ivy League educated, maybe, and an accomplished executive. That's a path I can take. My mom did that. Typically, that's a male-dominated path it has been historically and I'm glad it's not anymore um and um or I can learn a trade and I'm equally as proud of my father as I am my mom and I see the relationship between them between the, the two and that they both value each other and my dad goes out and works hard every day I can do both and both of those are okay it's also okay for my mom to make more money than my father it's okay for my mom to support my dad while he re-educates himself and retrenches and, and makes a comeback there's nothing wrong with that. And my dad doesn't have to be insecure in that process. Therefore, I don't have to be insecure. Um, he's now opened himself up, this young man, to so many other, so many potentially healthy relationships with women that he may have a problem with in the future. And he's also opened himself up to not being broke and having a lot of college debt. Um, I don't know. I think there's something very important there to be considered. These are the types of stories that we need right now. It's clear by now that marriage and social institutions and a sense of purpose matter to men. And so as we've seen these real challenges faced by men in education, work, and family, you're seeing some really difficult and troubling health consequences. And so the so-called deaths of despair from suicide, overdose, or alcohol, three times higher among men than among women. Suicide itself, three times higher among men and women and rising very quickly, especially among middle-aged men and younger men. So we can- That's a problem. Hope we can all agree on that. So forget 
when we talk about masculinity, we don't even have to think about women. It's important that there's a discussion about masculinity once, of course, it has to do with women, women, but there's a discussion about masculinity and the mental health of men that just has to do with men and them not dying and them not self-destructing and committing suicide. This is a problem. So we can see these as symptoms, I think, of a broader malaise, which is what's troubling boys and men. And maybe we we don't, you know, we we don't want too much masculinity, or we, we don't want this or that or whatever people say and call masculinity. To, okay, we don't want that. Do we want them to die? Do we want them to commit suicide? Do we think that's the answer? Do we want them to be depressed? Do we want them to be drunks? Do we want them to be pill addicts or on opioids? Do we want them to be murderers? Is that better? And for men in particular, this sense of purpose is very important. I think it's a human universal. A sense of purpose is very important. I think that that nails the whole discussion. For men, a sense of purpose is important. And remember, we make this statement, and I'm not qualifying or trying to cover my, my behind by saying this, but I'm also making a point that why is it that when we say things like this, and hopefully the people that are listening to this don't feel this way, but I know there are a lot of people that feel this way when we say men need to feel purpose, that we're saying that, oh, women don't need to feel purpose. That's not what we're saying. We're saying we're focusing on men. There's nothing wrong with that to focus on women or focus on children or focus on men when you're talking about something. But we need to be needed. There's a wonderful piece of work by an academic called Fiona Shand who looked at the last words that men had used to describe themselves before committing suicide or attempting suicide. And the top of the list were worthless and useless. I think if we... You said the words that men use, typically the most common words they're using when they're committing suicide is worthless and useless. And guess what happens when that man that feels worthless and useless doesn't commit suicide he's a terror he's either playing video games on the dark web <laughs> um connecting with people who are anarchists or whatever you want to call it um he's shooting up schools that's what he's doing he's uh being disrespectful to women um maybe he's a criminal um maybe he's addicted to drugs that's what they're doing when they feel worthless and useless but they haven't killed themselves they're doing it slowly they're living, but they're doing it slowly, and it's hurting everybody around them. Create a society in which so many men do feel like they're not needed, then it's no surprise that we see these deaths of despair, we see problems with opioids. Opioids are a much bigger problem for men than they are for women. Opioids are a much bigger problem for men than they are for women. Wonder why. One of the great tragedies of opioid deaths is the death rates are higher in part because the users are on their own. And so in some ways, the opioid epidemic is a perfect illustration of a whole series of things we're talking about, which is a loss of role in the family, a loss of status in the labor market, turning to drugs and being isolated and withdrawn. And so in that example, I think you can see a symptom of this broader male malaise that we just need to take it more seriously. And we have a cultural responsibility as a society, men and women together, to help men and boys to adjust to this new world because right now many of them are really struggling. Get smarter, faster with videos. Great, great video. There's something he said I want to go back to real quick. In that example, I think you can see a symptom of this broader male malaise that we just need to take it more seriously. And we have a cultural responsibility as a society, men and women together, to help men and boys to adjust to this new world. Because right now many of them are really struggling. Get smarter, faster. You know, what, what he said reminded me of something I heard my father say, um, how it was so profound when he said it, but I won't give you all the context, but he just said that, you know, purpose, um, for someone to have a purpose, my dad's a minister, for someone to have a purpose, a reason to live, that's one of the best medicines. Um, I think it's the, 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 the greatest medicine, purpose. A reason to get up, a reason to cut your hair, a reason to do push-ups, a, a reason to go to the gym, a reason to practice boxing or karate, a reason to learn a trade, um, a reason to come home. Um, that's the king of mental health. Um, and that's what I wanted to discuss this video.